This video is an outtake of my trip to the United States. If you wish to see the full documentary about my overall experiences, you can watch it if you like. This video goes deeper in some of the places I visited. This video is a mix of reused and brand new footage. Enjoy! 187 models to choose from. General Motors, makers of Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick and Cadillac with the GM mark of excellence. The walk around town eventually brought me to the glass giant looming over the city center, General Motors Renaissance Center. In the lobby that is open to the public, I was pleasantly surprised that besides the new models, there were also some radical concept cars on display. And that was a case of meeting my heroes. Here are some of the highlights. The Cadillac Le Mans is an example of Cadillac's limited flirting with performance. As a luxury car maker, Cadillac wasn't exactly renowned for its sportiness, save for entering the 24 hours of Le Mans once in 1950. Drivers race for their cars as Europe's most grueling car race begins. It's 24 hours non-stop with two drivers to each car, 31 cars in a struggle for mastery. But ended up in 10th place. Sailing on its newly found racing pedigree, designer Harley Earl went on to create a low-slung, two-seat, fiber-bodied luxury roadster in 1953, named after the endurance race. I think you could see this as Cadillac's version of the Chevrolet Corvette, the XLR of the 1950s. The car remained a concept car, with only four prototypes built and never entered production. The fate of some of these concept cars remained shrouded in mysteries, but this one was sent to the GM Heritage Center and was slightly altered. Down the road, the styling was updated with quad headlights, instead of two, and a revised rear end with sleeker fins. The car is a beauty and shows many design tricks later adopted on regular Caddy models. We jump forward in time and take a look at this Buick Silver Arrow 3. To put it bluntly, it's nothing more than a slightly customized Buick Riviera, you know, the funky Bowtail edition. But the Silver Arrow is further modified by designer Bill Mitchell, with an even lower roofline, rectangular headlights instead of the usual round ones, high-level warning lights placed in the roof that double as turning signals but look like the predecessor of the now mandatory third brake light, and was equipped with Max Track, a forerunner of modern-day traction control. In all, it looks a lot sleeker, kind of what the original Boto Riviera should have been. Now, some more cars were on display, but what if you want to see more than just these cars in the main lobby? This might seem as an unassuming warehouse in some office park. But follow me, because check this out. I present you the GM Heritage Center. That's right, the GM Heritage Center is not open to the public, but I was given the exclusive right to enter and film some of the most valuable and historically significant cars that General Motors ever made. Think of the first car of a certain model to ever roll off the assembly line and one-off concept cars. Let's start with a car that is arguably the most important of them all. The 1938 Buick Y-Job. What is it that makes this car so special? Well, it was renowned car designer Harley Earl's personal transportation and regarded as being the first ever concept car ever made. A car not intended for regular production, but to show off what would lie ahead in the future and what a car maker is capable of. Design-wise, I think the car is a full 10 years ahead of what was considered standard at the time. Headlights were no longer separated pods attached to the hood, but an integrated part of it. And on top of that, hidden, for a clean and sinister look, but are power-operated. And so are the windows, two years before they were added to a regular production car. All in all, the styling is just right, slim, 
subdued, and never overdone like you would see in the coming decades on American cars. The bumpers are narrow and tightly hug the body. The waterfall grille is flat and doesn't stick out too much, and the rear is sleek, with very modest tail lines that are inserted in logical round shapes, with a touch of airplane in it. General Motors also like to present itself as a company that has always sought ways to power their cars with alternative energy sources, like electric cars. In the mid-60s, GM played around with the idea of making an electric car, and deemed the new generation Corvair as the right car. Why? Well, first, it was the lightest car GM had at the time, and Corvair had a rather un-American setup. The engine was in the rear. Swap out the rear petrol engine with an electric one, and you have the frunk to put the batteries in. And voila, a concept vehicle named the Electrovair was created. When you first see it, Electrovair looks like any other car. Much like the countless other attempts to make an EV, this electric Corvair faces the same problems. The batteries were heavy and low-tech. The car wasn't really all that faster than a regular Corvair. Electrovair 2 can accelerate as quickly as a standard Corvair. But the range was, as expected, abysmal. The average range was about 60 miles, or 100 kilometers, and the batteries were worn out after charging them only a hundred times. The car was effectively useless. A better battery must be found to make a practical car but managed to generate some buzz within the automotive press. After that, the Electrovair was quickly forgotten, and it would take another half a century before GM would actually create its very first regular production EV. As mentioned, GM took the European Corvair as the base for the Electrovair experiment, but more vehicles were based on the Corvair platform, like this Corvair Greenbrier rampside truck, or Corvair 95 for purists. The Greenbrier line consists of various van and pickup configurations, much like the German Volkswagen Transporter lineup, and this was Chevy's go at competing with the ever-increasing popularity of the Volkswagen cars and vans in America. What makes this pickup so special are three things. First, the so-called cap-forward design, rather un-American considering pickups and vans in America until then featured massive hoods. But the V-Dub's transporter didn't, the driver was sitting on top of the front axle. The second thing is the six-cylinder boxer engine that is mounted under the hood, uh, no sorry, the rear floor, as opposed to a regular inline six or V8. Once again, very much like how Volkswagen used to do it. The last thing that makes this particular truck so interesting is the so-called ramp-side body style, where not only the rear hatch could open, but also the side. On the right side, the body panel could fold down for easy entry and loading. Curbside loading possible with Chevrolet's ramp-side pickup. Convenience that is especially important in delivery operations on busy city streets. This Le Sabre concept was the next step in the design career of Harley Earl, inspired by the success of the Buick White Job some 13 years prior, only a Second World War was getting in the way. The Le Sabre concept was highly influential in many, many ways. The car is from 1951, but features a lot of styling gimmicks that would be adopted by General Motors in the coming years, as well as almost the entire car industry. The Le Sabre was part of a series of so-called show cars, or dream cars. Mm, it's also my dream car. They were part of GM's Motorama shows, big venues and parades that traveled around the country to excite people for what they could expect to see at the local dealers in the coming years. The Sabre, thrusting toward tomorrow. This is the mood of the Motorama. The Le Sabre was never meant to be a production car, but it makes an interesting car nonetheless. The front end is unique because where are the headlights? They are positioned right next to each other in the middle. Turn on the headlights and they'll pop up behind the concave oval centerpiece, designed like a jet intake. Besides its far-out styling, the car's equipment truly came from a different planet. Electric windows, heated seats, 12-volt electrical system when 6-volt was still the norm, a sensor that would detect rain, so that the soft top would automatically close when it started to rain, and it could run on regular fuel and methanol. Styling-wise, it was also ahead of its time. The front bumper, with its so-called Dagmar bumper holders, would later be adopted by Cadillac, and the tail fins with the triple tail lights were all the rage some five years later. Not to mention the exhausts that are integrated in the rear bumper, 
a classic American styling gimmick. The 1976 Buick Estate Wagon is among the largest station wagons ever made, and 1976 is the last year of this gargantuan dinosaur, before being replaced by GM's downsized models. Coming in at 231 inches or 5 meters and 88 centimeters, this wood-paneled station wagon once ruled suburban America, the car of choice for the well-to-do and the closest thing to a Cadillac station wagon that would compete with such rivals like the Chrysler Town & Country and the Mercury Colony Park. An interesting feature is the so-called clamshell tailgate, nicknamed the Glideaway tailgate. Simply put the key in the little keyhole to the side, turn it, and the rear will split in half. The window will electronically disappear in the roof, and the rear door will slide under the floor. It is often said that American cars from the 1950s, 60s and 70s are huge, but wouldn't you know that cars from the turn of the century could be massive as well, introducing the 1911 Oldsmobile Limited. This car is from the days the car industry was pretty much a wild west of brand ownership. Companies were established, bought out, changed hands and disappeared faster than my Dodge Challenger rental car will reach 100 miles an hour. This Oldsmobile was bigger and more expensive than a contemporary Cadillac, for instance. The car sold for 7,000 bucks back then, and that is now, adjusted to inflation, somewhere above $200,000, so modern-day Bentley territory, although its current value is estimated to be around $1 million. Better not scratch it. But not only the car and its price are massive, so is its engine, a 707 cubic inch or 11.6 liters of six-cylinder thunder will get you up to speed, making around 60 horsepower. Let's say I've seen stables with more horses that were smaller than this engine. What if you don't want American chicken wings for dinner, but Italian pasta with meatballs instead? Might I suggest you take a good look at this one-off Pontiac Pegasus right here. It's an American Firebird turned into a European GT, and it's the only one in the world. Here's the deal. The head of the design, Bill Mitchell, more or less the successor of Harley Earl, was fantasizing about what the new generation Pontiac Firebirds should, could and would look like for the 1970 model year. It was brought to his attention that a colleague designer over at Chevrolet was busy working on a new generation Camaro, Chevy's version of the Firebird, also for the 1970 model year, and took inspiration from European sports cars. This designer, Jerry Palmer, thought that the Camaro could benefit from some Italian flair, specifically from the 1958 Ferrari Testarossa. He designed a Camaro Rosa sketch and showed it to Mitchell, who liked the sketch so much he used it as a base for the design proposals for the new Firebird and ultimately led to the creation of this Pontiac Pegasus right here. Pegasus. It's chicken parmesan on wheels. It's a Ferrari Firebird. It's every New York mobster's dream car, but they could never get their hands on it because it was Bill Mitchell's personal ride for a couple of years. And do believe me when I say this is a Ferrari Firebird, because the real magic is under the hood. No regular American V8 engine is to be found. This GT is powered by a 4.4 liter V12 from Ferrari. And the story goes it was donated by old man Ferrari himself. As it turned out, the fiery 350 horsepower V12 didn't quite match well with the sluggish 3-speed GM automatic transmission, as favored by Bill, who thought that driving should be a stress-free and relaxed experience. The transmission was eventually swapped by a 5-speed manual from Ferrari. A better choice. One corner in the building is specifically designated for America's one and almost only sports car, the Corvette. One single car of every generation is present, parked right next to the concept vehicles that preceded them at Grand Reveals and Design Studios. And a common theme is that many, if not all of these concept Corvettes, were designed around the idea of having a mid-engine configuration. Doesn't make this Corvette look too bad, now does it? The first one is the 1968 Chevrolet Arrow 2, designed by Zora Arcus Duntoff, who made it his personal crusade within GM to push for mid-engine Corvettes, 
according to him, the only right configuration. The car looks radical, with very pronounced coke bottle styling, with a 400 horsepower, 427 cubic inch V8 that would almost make it to the showrooms, but GM didn't want to disrupt the already established success of a front-engine Corvette. A following attempt was made in 1972 with the Reynolds Corvette Experimental. The mid-engine layout was still very much present, but now with a new ingredient, the use of aluminium MMM. It has been said that one pound of aluminium can replace two pounds of steel, resulting in a very light but evenly strong car. The use of aluminium in the 1970s was more widespread among European sports cars, but much more a novelty for American car makers, since they preferred the use of steel. The third car is from a year later, the 1973 Chevrolet Aerovet Experimental. This one shows an even more radical and sharp design, based on, you guessed it, a mid-engine layout, but with an even bigger and more unusual engine in mind, rotary engines. Two rotary engines were placed in the car, making almost 500 horsepower. It was a monster, but corporate GM decided to kill the rotary engine program that was also going to end up in the Chevrolet Vega. And Arcus Dantov wasn't happy about the choice of engine either. The car never reached production. The last one in a row is from 1986. The Corvette Indy Concept. Two years after the release of the revolutionary aerodynamic Ford Taurus, you can really see designers were looking ahead to get rid of the boxiness of the 80s and embrace the flowing and soft lines of the 1990s, like in this concept Corvette. The car featured futuristic tech for the 80s, like displays in the doors and a rear-view camera, four-wheel steering and a very early version of in-car navigation. <music>